welcome to uh, the school funding lawsuit webinar. We're just going to give everybody a minute to get um, to get situated here as you log into your audio, and we'll get started in just in just a minute. So thank you for joining us tonight. We've got two superstar attorneys uh, from the Education Law Center and the Public Interest Law Center. We're really excited to have you here tonight. So I guess we'll just um, let you know how it's going to go. So um, after we, we're, we have kind of a big group on tonight, so we're going to ask that during this presentation, you just stay on mute, please, and put all of your questions into the chat. And then we will work on answering questions in the chat as we go along. And then we'll see at the end if there's an opportunity to ask questions by raising hands. I'm not sure about that. Um, so we will really try to focus on the chat as the place where we're going to answer questions. And so um, I'm Susan Spicka with the Education with Education Voters of Pennsylvania. We're a statewide nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that really works to build public support for strong public schools in every community. Um, really excited to have you here tonight. Really excited to have um, attorneys from the Education Law Center and Public Interest Law Center. Um, so everybody's on mute, and I'm going to turn it over to Laura Johnson, who is a parent advocate who um, has brought some people here tonight, and I think she just wants to say a few words before we get started. I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for setting this up. Um, thank you to everyone who turned out tonight. Um, I think this is gonna be a really, really good event. And especially I just wanna say thank you to Maura and Dan for presenting, because um, this is such an important issue, not just for the students who are in our schools right now, but for the students of the future and for the, the future of the Commonwealth. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was, is that um, the group I work with, Pennsylvanians for Fair Funding, is currently holding a student art contest that's geared around allowing um, students from across the state to tell their story, particularly their story in regards to what it means to them to be underfunded and to not be receiving the resources they need. So I'm gonna put that information in the chat, but there are uh, cash prizes for students in each age group, which is upper elementary, middle school and high school. So if you know student artists who'd be interested in doing that, who would be interested in sharing um, just kind of the, the impact that underfunding has on them, um, you can share that with them. So thank you. Thanks again, everybody for being here. Okay. Um, well, I, I share my, my thanks too for, for coming and I think there's a great crowd. Um, my name is Daniel Rick Acklesberg. I'm a staff attorney at the Public Interest Law Center, um, along with my colleague, Mara McInerney from the Education Law Center. Um, we'll be talking about um, school funding and, and what we're trying to do about it. The way that we've structured this presentation is sort of the problem and the solution, or at least one of the solutions. Um, the problem being, why are schools so underfunded? What is wrong with the system? And then the solution is, at least one of the solutions, um, is the lawsuit that uh, I know a lot of you are interested in hearing about. So I'm gonna do the problem and Mara will do the solution. Um, a little bit about our organizations, I'll, I'll, I'll do mine, I'll let Mara just go through with the Education Law Centers. Public Interest Law Center is a small nonprofit civil rights law firm um, in, located in Philadelphia. Um, we use high impact legal strategies to advance civil, social, and economic rights of communities um, in the Philadelphia region and in Pennsylvania. Um, we work across issue areas. Um, so we um, do education, but we also um, have a housing, voting, disability, uh, uh, environmental, and employment practice. Um, and um, we have been around um, for about 50 years now. Um, Marge, do you want to just talk a bit about the Education Law Center? Sure. The Education Law Center um, it's, is a statewide legal advocacy organization, and our focus is on ensuring access to quality public education across <laughs> Pennsylvania. We have offices in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. We work in three strategic areas. One is equal access to a quality education. The second is adequate and equitable school funding. And the third is dismantling the school to prison pipeline. Always our focus is on the students who have been most marginalized. Thank you. Um, so I want to just start with, with um, sort of a, a couple of, of table setting slides. All right. And this one will look particularly, I know there's a, a big group from Pottstown that uh, look like a similar story to something you've experienced. All right. So, um, so as coronavirus closes schools, wealthier districts send laptops home with the students. What about poor districts? This is an article from the Philadelphia Inquirer, right? Not a big shock given what we've experienced. No, this is a familiar story at this point. Um, but 
What's really amazing about this story um, is this. March 18th, 2020, right? So the first day schools were closed in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was March 16th, 2020, right? And the inequities in Pennsylvania's system of school funding are so apparent and so gross um, that by two, two days after schools were closed, the front page of the inquiry noted, hey, you know what? Kids from low-wealth districts are, are, are really out of luck, right? That's, when you step back and think about it, that's a crazy, crazy thing to, to accept that that's our reality. Um, the second are two, um, two quotes. Um, so ask yourself, who, who said these? Uh, Pennsylvania has significant financial inequities in its system of school funding with one of the largest gaps of any state in the country in per child spending between the Commonwealth's poorest and wealthiest districts. So that's the money going in, huge gaps, right? Um, and then the results that you get from it. The Commonwealth also has some of the most significant reading achievement gaps between low-income students and students of color and their white, more affluent peers. Similar gaps are evident with respect to high school graduation rates, right? So the outcomes, huge gaps in the outcomes. Now, is this, is this from something that Susan Spica wrote? Um, you know, from PCCY, from some advocacy organization? No. This is from the Department of Education, the Commonwealth's Department of Education, from their ESSA plan as recently as August 2019. So we're going to go through a lot of statistics um, um, when we describe the problem. What you have to know is that we're not showing you anything secret here. The statistics we're showing you, for the most part, are just sitting up on the state's website. Right? This whole thing is hiding in plain sight. Also, just as a background, I want to apologize. It is like kind of bedtime in my household, so you might hear some toddler uh, yells, but just the, the reality of the of a seven o'clock presentation in the era of COVID. Um, so when we think about the, the problem, there's a couple of themes that we're gonna come back to. All right, what's wrong with this system? Well, the first is a really fundamental one. There is no goal in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, at least at the state level, of fully funding public schools. It's not as if each year the state appropriations, the House and Senate appropriations committees or the education committees get together and say, hey, what do schools need to reach a certain goal? Or what should class size look like in Pennsylvania? And then how are we gonna make sure that schools have the resources to do those things, right? There is no goal of fully funding public schools. That doesn't happen. It does happen at the local level, at the school board level, we're, but only in districts that can afford that conversation, right? That can afford to ask the question. Um, so if you're a wealthy, if you're in a, a wealthy suburban school district, Right, your superintendent makes a budget presentation to your school board and says, these are the things I need this year. These are the programs I want. This is the curriculum I want. These are the books I want. This is the technology I want. And the school board for the most part agrees and pays for it. But if you're a low wealth school district, that's not the conversation. It's not what do our kids need this year, it's what can we afford to do this year. And that all stems from the decision at the top at the legislature, to not actually try to fully fund public schools. Um, the second is that the state, of all the education dollars that are spent in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the state makes a relatively low contribution. Most of our funding is from local taxpayers, and that creates really serious inequities that I'll show you. The third is that most of our funding is not based on any rational formula. For those in Pottstown, this will be familiar. It's the whole harmless issue. Um, and then when you put it all together, we have a system where low wealth communities need the most, try the hardest, but have the least. Um, so um, each bar here is a, is a state. And what you're looking at is within a state um, of all the money spent on education, K through 12 education in that state, how much of it comes from the state government itself versus um, local taxpayers, right? Every state is a mix of state and local taxpayers. What you see is that Pennsylvania is all the way sort of there on the, on the end, um, because Pennsylvania consistently um, is one of the lowest contributors to education relatively within its state. So um, of all the dollars that are spent on K through 12 education in Pennsylvania, about 37 to 38% actually comes from state government itself. The vast majority of the rest of it comes from um, local taxpayers. And that's a real problem when you live in an economically segregated state, because here, here's how that, that plays out in Delaware County. Um, just one example, um, a fairly compact county uh, in Pennsylvania. So what you're looking at 
is every school district in Delaware County, right? The middle column is the tax burden um, that that those that property that property owners pay. Um, the state calls it equalized mills, and, and equalized mills. What what it is is the state needed a way to to try to compare across counties what the effective tax rate is in a county, right? And so they forget what your own millage rate is and what your own assessment value is. The state comes up with a value of what they think your a county's true assessed value is, and they see how much you're really paying, and they say, okay, what's the effective tax rate on property in that school district? Okay, and so you have this term called equalized mills. Well, to see what you, the state thinks your effective tax rate is, just divide the equalized mills by ten. So you see the Marple Newtown School District there in red. I'm um, thirteen equalized mills. The state thinks Marple Newtown taxpayers, their effective tax rate is one point three percent of the value of their property each year. Um, now you see just within Delaware County, there's a huge variation, right? Marble Newtown at 13 equalized mills, all the way at the bottom, the William Penn School District, 34.6 equalized mills, right? Instead of 1.3% of the value of their property, it's 3.5% of the value of their property. Huge variations. Um, and that's a problem. But the real crux of the issue is the next column over, which is how much funding is generated from that tax rate. Right? So we'll go back up to Marble Newtown. Tax rate of 1.3% of the value of their properties, they generate $21,000 per child from that tax rate. The William Penn School District, taxing at a rate far higher, I think the fifth highest in the entire state, they generate $8,800 per child. The communities, low wealth communities are trying harder. I'll give you another couple examples, purposely some extreme examples, okay? One of our, our Commonwealth's wealthiest districts, New Hope, versus one of our poorest, Reading. Um, so New Hope taxes a rate of 12.6 equalized mills, again, about 1.3% of the value of their property each year. There's a lot of big properties in New Hope, right? So from that tax rate, they generate $25,000 per kid. Um, the state kicks in $4,600 to New Hope, State and local resources combined, they have over $30,000 per child. Redding taxes at 25.9 equalized mills, uh, over twice what New Hope taxes at. But rather than $25,000 per kid, New Hope generates $2,500 per kid, right? One tenth of what New Hope generates. Redding generates one tenth of what New Hope generates. Now, the state does give more to Redding than it does to New Hope. And state funding is not big enough. It's totally irrational, but the money that comes from the state itself is generally progressive in that more does go to lower wealth districts. Um, but it's not nearly enough to close the gaps, right? So state and local resources combined, New Hope has $17,000 more per child than Reading. You know, well, who needs more? Who actually needs to be spending more on their children? Um, one of the easiest ways to look at the, the relative needs of a school district, and this is well settled in education policy and in state law, is to look for the presence of children in poverty, right? Children in poverty are bringing with them um, a lot of attendant needs, right? Maybe it's hunger, maybe it's higher rates of transiency, maybe it's less frequently, uh, less frequent uh, high quality pre-K, whatever it is. Children in poverty, as a general rule, require more resources to have the same success. Well, New Hope, 9.7% of students are in poverty. In Reading, it's 95% of students, right? Another really resource needy group of kids are kids learning English, right? They need smaller class sizes to get them up to speed so that they can get to English proficiency. Um, again, well-settled in education law, well-settled in state law, well-settled in education policy and well-settled in state law. Um, in New Hope, 2.8% of kids are learning English. And in Reading, it's 26%. Right, the communities, low wealth communities need the most, try the hardest, but get the least. Um, you know, I, Pottstown, obviously uh, a district where I know a lot of you all are from, just for some context of where Pottstown fits in all this. Um, Pottstown tax is at a rate of well, 70, about 70% 70 of Pottstown kids are considered economically disadvantaged. Uh, Pottstown tax is at a rate of 33.8 equalized mills, that is sixth out of the 499 school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And despite those efforts, and we'll get into this calculation, I think Mara's gonna talk about this calculation, but by the state's own metrics, Pottstown is $3,700 per student behind what it needs each year to get to adequacy. And that's just 
basic education funding that doesn't count capital spending that doesn't count special education, right? And, and the impact of that, right? We showed you the slide from the inquiry at the beginning. You all, for those of you in Pottstown, you lived it, right? Coronavirus shuts down schools. Your elementary students weren't back and weren't back online until May. Um, how did we get here? So um, in um, 19, up until 1991, Pennsylvania did have a school funding formula where it looked at the relative poverty of a district, the size of a district and things like that. And then in 1991, we entered into this ice age. And what do I mean by that? Um, how the state viewed the demographics of a school district, frozen time. So instead of looking at how a district is changing, instead, the state just said, well, what did you get in 1991? We'll add a percent. What did you get in 1991? We'll add another percent. What did you get in 1991? We'll flat fund you this year. And so um, um, year after year, school districts began to be funded based on what they looked like in 1991, right? Um, a lot has changed in the world since 1991, right? Um, in 1991, George H.W. Bush was the president of the United States. Miguel Gorbachev was finishing out his term as the, so in, as the premier of the Soviet Union. There still was, at least for a few months, a Soviet Union. Barack Obama was the president of Harvard Law Review and LeBron James was eight years old. A lot of things have changed, but Pennsylvania was stuck just year over year using 1991 statistics. And that's where a lot of the whole harmless problem comes from that we'll talk about. Um, so um, not all is bad in, in the Commonwealth in terms of how we distribute education funds. So in 2016, um, the state finally stopped looking at 1991 demographics to a point um, and instead enacted something that's colloquially known as the fair funding formula. And what the fair funding formula does is it actually looks at the characteristics of a district and it takes into account um, the number of kids in poverty, the number of kids in concentrated poverty, the number of kids learning English, things like that. Things that every policymaker agrees changes the needs of a student body. Um, and, and it does so in a, in a reasonable way, right? How it measures the relative needs of a student in poverty is, is, a, is, is, is fine. But there's some real fundamental flaws in the fair funding formula, at least how, how it's worked. Um, so the first is that it purposefully excludes the total funding that's needed. It only looks at the relative needs of a district. So if we're distributing a dollar, what percentage goes to Pottstown? What percentage goes to Philadelphia? What percentage goes to New Hope? But it doesn't actually say how big the pie should be, right? And so what it does is it creates a zero sum game where if you get a dollar more, you're getting it at the expense of another, of another um, school district. And because it's not saying how big the pie should be, if the state's not distributing enough, you're still leaving local school districts to fend for themselves to come up with funds. Um, it also only applies to funding added, at, added after its adoption, right? So these massive inequities are locked in. And so, so I talked about 1991 demographics, okay. So as of 2016, we distributed $5.5 billion through that old crazy system, largely looking at 1991 demographics. We still distribute $5.5 billion in the exact same way, through the exact same demographics. What's going, the money that's distributed through the fair funding formula is just the quote unquote new money. The money that's been distributed after the fair funding formula was enacted, which is about $700 million. So $5.5 billion still goes through the crazy system and $700 million goes through the fair funding formula. If you started over about a billion, $1.2 billion would switch from district to district to district. Um, Susan uh, Spica is fond, fond of calling this the, the hunger games of Pennsylvania education funding. And I think it's really an apt, it's an apt metaphor because what this has allowed the state to do is to pit school districts against each other. Um, so um, you all know that again, particularly for the people from Pottstown, that Pottstown is particularly hurt by, by hold armless. Um, so if, on a per student basis, it's the eighth highest uh, the, it suffers more than all but eight, um, seven school districts in the Commonwealth. So if Hold Harmless went away, Pottstown would gain about $3,600 per child. Um, but here's the problem with that, right? We're not actually saying how big the pie should be, and we've created this zero-sum game. So for every school district that wins on a redistribution of, of funds, there's a school district that loses. 
right? And these school districts that lose funds may not be wealthy. Now, they may, relatively speaking, not, you know, not need as much funding as a Pottstown, but they still might not have enough, right? And so what the state has done with this zero-sum game is allow districts to be pit against each other because they can now say, hey, 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 if Pottstown gets sufficient funding, it's coming from yours. Um, there's some other problems um, with, with Hold Harmless, though, too. And this is from um, David Misenkis from Power. I know there's some Power members on the phone. Um, and David has done some amazing graphs about the, the inequities, the serious inequities um, in, um, in Pennsylvania school funding. Um, so um, what this graph shows is um, the, the horizontal graph is a percentage of poverty, students in poverty in a district. Um, and the uh, vertical axis is how much state funding you're getting, just state funding. Now, in and then the, um, the line is your expected funding as a function of your poverty, okay? So um, what you generally see is that as you move out on that horizontal line, you get more and more funding. Right, because as I said, it's a crazy system, it's an irrational system, but it is generally progressive. State funding itself is generally progressive, right? The poor districts tend to get more funds. Um, <clears throat> so that line is your expected funding as a function of just your poverty rate. Um, but what you see is that districts are all over the place, right? If you're above the line, you get more than you would expect as a function of your poverty. If you're below the line, you get less than you'd expect as a function of your poverty. Um, but there's a color and on the right uh, of your screen, it tells you what the chart is. So if you are a district above the median in the number of kids of color, if you're a less white district, you're a red dot. If you're a whiter district, you're a blue dot. So again, above the line, more than you'd expect as a function of your poverty, below the line, less than you'd expect as a function of your poverty, right? The racial implications of this are so clear. Right. And, you know, it's not as if um, it's not as if every underfunded district has a huge number of children of color, but just about every district with huge numbers of children of color, with large numbers of children of color um, is underfunded. Um, so um, what's happened in Harrisburg um, over the last six years, um, as I said, um, the state since the enactment of the fair funding formula, um, has put in about $700 million into basic education funding. Um, counting inflation, that's a decrease, actually. right? So people want to tout what's happened in Harrisburg recently. Well, practically speaking, we are actually still living with Tom Corbett's budget cuts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And the gaps between high wealth and low wealth districts have increased. You know, why does this matter? Well, like this is a, a child from um, the Philadelphia School District. Um, who is in a school and this Philadelphia school district has had its own significant budget problems and, um, and stopped spending on, on capital repairs, right? And this is a child from a, a school in Northeast Philadelphia where um, the water was leaking in the ceiling above him, causing paint to peel. That paint was lead, it fell on his desk, he ate the paint and was severely lead poisoned, right? The Scranton school district had to close because of asbestos, right? And it's of course not just the conditions of buildings, it's also the outcomes right? You don't have to love standardized tests, but what they show are profound gaps between low wealth kids and high wealth kids, between black kids, between white kids. And it's not anything inherent about children. It's that these kids are going to school without the basic resources that educators know they need. And if you don't like standardized tests, look at college rates. Because what you see in Pennsylvania is that um, uh, a low wealth, uh, a, a, a child, a, a low a economically disadvantaged child, in a high spending district is more likely not only to go to college, but to graduate college than an economically disadvantaged kid from a low spending district, right? Because that child, that first child has resources invested in them. All of this matters. Um, and so um, faced with a profoundly inequitable system, faced with results that should shock the conscience, some of the biggest gaps in the state, um, I will let Mara talk about like what we're going to do about it. And just take us a second to transition here. Thanks so much, Dan. Really appreciate your laying all of that out. I am now going to share my screen. 
bear with me for a moment, but a lot of what Dan talked about in terms of the inequities, the very stark inequities that we see are really, can you see my screen now? No, okay, let's see, this isn't working. Okay, can you see it now? Great, thanks. So as Dan pointed out, the- um, Hey Mar, just so you know, it's in, it's in um, like we can see all of your, your notes and things like that. Okay, hold on just a moment. Apologies. Okay, and somehow it went right to the beginning, even though I had it queued up. <laughs> but it's, it's working. Okay, so um, as Dan laid out, it is really the inadequate state funding that has driven this over-reliance on local property taxes and resulted in gross disparities between high wealth and low wealth school districts across the Commonwealth. So in response to uh, what we saw in terms of the deficiencies in so many of our school districts coming out of the recession, we had, as you recall, school districts who were slashing budgets that had to reduce staff. We had bigger class sizes, all of those things. We filed this lawsuit in November of 2014. We filed it in the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court, which deals with issues concerning state agencies. And we had two claims here. One is that the General Assembly had violated its constitutional duty to support and maintain a thorough and efficient system of public education to serve the needs of the Commonwealth. That's what we call our education clause. And that requires our General Assembly to ensure that children have access to this thorough and efficient system of public education to provide a quality education for all children. In addition, we allege that the gross disparities between high wealth and low wealth districts could not be justified by any legitimate state interest violating the Equal Protection Clause. So on behalf of children in low wealth school districts, we allege... You mute yourself, Mara. The host had muted me, sorry. Are we back? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so these are our petitioner school districts. You'll see William Penn, Panther Valley, Greater Johnstown, Shenandoah Valley, School District of Lancaster, Wilkes-Barre. Also two organizational plaintiffs, the uh, NAACP State Conference and the Pennsylvania Association of Rural and Small Schools. As you can see, this is emblematic of the problem. We have low wealth school districts across the Commonwealth, rural, suburban, urban, who have been uh, uh, harmed by this. And we also brought the case on behalf of parents in particular school districts, including uh, Philadelphia school districts. While not a, Philadelphia is not a petitioner, we brought this on behalf of parents. So these are our respondents in the case. So these are our legislative leaders. Um, the, the, our legislative leaders, Brian Cutler and Jay Corman, as well as the governor, as well as the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, this is current Secretary Ortega there, as well as the School Board of Pennsylvania. So what are we asking the court to do? We're asking the court to declare the current system of funding education unconstitutional as violating both the equal protection provisions as well as our education clause, because the state has failed to live up to its obligation to ensure that it is adequately funded to meet the needs of all of our students. Instead, we have the system that Dan has described in detail, which gives much less money to school districts, to the students in low wealth districts who absolutely have the greatest need. We asked them to order, we're asking the court to order the legislature to cease using this inadequate funding scheme and to order the legislature to create and maintain a funding system that enables all students to graduate college and career ready to meet state standards, to receive the high quality education that they're entitled to under our constitution. This is very similar to other state funding cases that have been pursued in other states. Majority of states across the country have brought these types of lawsuits. Pennsylvania is unique in that for many, many years, dating back to the 1990s, there's also a case in the 1970s, the, the court said that this is a political question, no one can bring it, this isn't something that can be determined by courts, because this is a function of the legislature, and it's only the legislature get, can, that can determine this policy. That uh, 
that precedent was actually overruled in our case. That's why it's taken us seven years to get to trial because we actually had to go up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and they determined that actually, no, this is not a political question. This is precisely the uh, function of the courts is to ensure that it is a check and balance on our state legislature to make sure that they're living up to their obligations under our constitution. So what do we need to prove? Well, under the education clause, what we call our adequacy claim, we have to determine really what is this constitutional standard? What does it mean to have, a, to, to have the General Assembly support and maintain a thorough and efficient system of public education? What is the standard that we're trying to uh, live up to in terms of that quality education, what it looks like? Has that standard been met or is the system really irrational and not a thorough and efficient system of public education because it's failing to meet the needs, failing to meet the needs of all students? Does it require more money in order to meet their obligation? Does the state need to provide more funding and ensure that that money is more equitably distributed? And of course, as Dan discussed, there have been a lot of junctures where our General Assembly has said, wow, we have to ensure that children are receiving what they need. They did a costing out study in 2007 to determine what adequacy was and to establish adequacy targets actually under our state law, and yet they failed to fund it. And then later on in 2015, they adopt a fair funding formula, but it only applies to a very small percentage of the money, only 11% of the money, so we're not driving all the funds through it. So they recognize that there's something wrong, but they're failing to meet their obligation to ensure that they've addressed it. In addition, are the disparities, the gross disparities, 16,000, um, as Dan talked about, between high wealth and low wealth school districts, are they justified? So what are respondents' arguments? Um, Pennsylvania is already a high spender. They are, we're above the national average in terms of NEEP scores, and we've got a lot of students that are scoring high. But if you drill down and you look at our low wealth school districts, you see that they're not able to achieve at the levels of our high spending school districts. So you see that there's this great disparity, as Dan underscored, in terms of educational outcomes of our students. And we can tie that to educational opportunity gaps in schools. The resources aren't there. The class sizes are larger. They don't have functioning libraries. They don't have enough school staff or, uh, or counselors, et cetera. So will the new formula solve the problem? So 2015, we adopt that fair funding formula. It's a bipartisan effort in 2014. Um, and yet, the majority of basic education funding doesn't go through the formula at all. As we talked about, it only applies to 11% of basic education funding. So uh, failing students have access to the same programs as successful students. That's obviously not true, and we will have the evidence to prove it at trial. Funding doesn't explain the outcomes in Pennsylvania. That is a uh, one of the arguments that appears to be asserted by the respondents that it won't matter. Money doesn't make a difference. And what all of the research says and what anecdotal experience tells us is that additional funding will absolutely make a difference in terms of educational outcomes and graduation rates and the ability of children to uh, be successful in school. So where are we right now in the case? Uh, we have completed discovery. We've exchanged a lot of documents. Uh, we've had over 70 depositions that have been conducted. We've exchanged many expert reports and rebuttal expert reports. Uh, we, the summary judgment motions that were partial summary judgments have, have been defeated already. And now we have a trial tentatively scheduled for September 9th of 2021. So in just a few months, we will be bringing this case to trial. And what our expert reports have really demonstrated, what our, de what our fact, fact depositions demonstrate, is that number one, our schools are desperately underfunded and lack basic resources to meet the needs of students. And number two, that the General Assembly has failed to do something about it, even though they're very aware of the fact that, they, that schools are not receiving an adequate uh, amount of money. So what are we gonna show race and class disparities? As Dan mentioned, Pennsylvania's districts are actually among the most segregated uh, in the nation. Districts that receive the most revenue are disproportionately white. Districts receiving the least revenue are disproportionately Black and Latinx. 50% of Black students, 40% of 
uh, Latinx students attend Pennsylvania's lowest wealth districts in the lowest quintile, uh, among the most underfunded. And as Dan pointed out, we also have the study done by David Mazankis that talked about the, the, the fact that just based on race alone, these children are shortchanged $2,000 per pupil. So we will show that all students can learn and that money matters and that poverty can be mitigated by significant factors in school and it begins early with pre-K and early education. Uh, and the research is clear that when schools are given enough resources, they can counter the effects of poverty. So we can look at other school funding cases that have been successful and look at their outcomes and see what they've been able to achieve. And what you learn is that graduation rates go up, ac academic outcomes are better, and that it really has a significant impact on the trajectory of, of children who then are able to get it to graduate from school and then go on to college and career. So how much do districts need? So uh, this Pennsylvania uh, schools need an additional 4.6 billion. This is actually from one of the expert reports that was done in our case. And all that, what that expert report did was to use the adequacy targets and update them to current day. And look at the adequacy targets that were actually adopted into law in uh, 2008 based on a costing out study done in 2007. So it was, the study was done by Professor Matt Kelly about Penn State, um, and more than half of all school districts were more than $2,000 behind per student based on the adequacy targets that were actually established by the General Assembly and are currently in our law. So if you go to uh, uh, fundourschoolspa.org, you will be able to go to this interactive map and see how much your school district what is underfunded. Look at the short, shortfalls under fundourschoolspa.org. Here are some examples from some of our school districts as well as other low wealth school districts. So you see this is underfunding per pupil in each of these low wealth school districts. William Penn, Lancaster, Philadelphia were represented in our school funding case, but you see Pottstown, $3,728 per student. So imagine what that looks like in a classroom of 25 to 30 students. So this is a conservative estimate because it's based on a 2007 costing out study that actually utilized older uh, academic uh, standards and requirements. So it's actually less rigorous than what's required today because they use the standards from 2005, doesn't account for 3 billion pension cost spike, doesn't account for the proliferation of charter schools and cyber charter schools, which this year has been an increasing cost for school districts. Um, it also doesn't account for the fact that we have higher special education costs, that there are a lot of additional costs that have been born to bear. Um, and with the new basic education funding weights, that increases to 4.8 billion. So if you use that uh, 2015, uh, uh, you know, fair funding formula, then you're looking at even a larger uh, gap and shortchanging of school districts. So would sending all the state funding through the formula actually fix this problem? The answer is no because the formula doesn't set a benchmark for what students need. It doesn't look at adequacy. It just looks at how the pie should be shared. It did not look at adequacy at all and whether there was sufficient funding to meet the needs of students in all of the school districts. It just said how we should divide the current existing pie. So William Penn School District would get 900, 300, 931 more per student if there was no hold harmless. Again, that's a part of the equation that Dan talked about um, that has significantly uh, shortchanged a lot of districts. William Penn School Districts is $4,836 per student behind the target for adequate funding in state law. Wouldn't change the system that's still over-reliant on local property taxes because it wouldn't be touching, it didn't touch state funding at all or the low state share um, and education funding shouldn't beat the zero some game. So sending all the state money through the formula would not fix the problem. Here's an example, and I want to give us time for questions. Um, so we've got school districts, a quarter of all shrinking school districts. So remember, going back to that uh, sort of ice age uh, slide, 
we are really looking at demographics that aren't currently accurate. So big Beaver Falls area school district, Beaver County, 75% economically disadvantaged students, 3,451 per student adequacy shortfall. They would lose $1,106 per student if hold harmless ended with no additional funding. And we don't want to shortchange our uh, school districts. Um, and then here's another example, Erie County, 72% economically disadvantaged, already having adequacy shortfall, would lose $3,000.42 per student if whole time was ended with no additional funding. So we want to ensure that we have a system that works for our rural school districts, that works for those who have sort of stranded costs with their school districts that may be in rural areas in, in, in particular, et cetera. So, oops, so sorry. Um, so there are some proposals for new funding that are currently out there. One is Governor Wolf's proposal, which would add 1.35 billion in basic education funding and really targets the most underfunded districts. It also ensures that there aren't going to be districts that will be left in the cold um, through that. That particular formula, 200 million in new special education funding, which is critically important because that's an area that's been flat funded or just uh, very, very small increases over time. And we again have over reliance on local property taxes to meet the needs of students with disabilities. And we've seen that across the board and then would invest 30 million in pre-K and in Head Start. This is a wonderful initiative. It's an important first step in the right direction um, and we certainly support it, uh, but it's unclear what will happen with that proposal at this point. Um, another uh, op opportunity is Level Up Pennsylvania, which was just introduced last week as House Bill 1167. And that's really targeting our 100 uh, most in need school districts. It's uh, supplemental. It's saying this is another alternative, another way in which we could try to address this issue. Uh, the American Rescue Plan, I think, is important to talk about because that's an additional $5 billion for schools across the Commonwealth. It's a significant amount of money. It is uh, money that would be going to uh, school districts across the board and specifically additional funding for Title I school districts, so really benefiting a lot of our low wealth districts. The problem is it is temporary. It is one-time funds that really requires cautious spending. In fact, there was a letter from the state legislature that talked about the fact that you shouldn't be using this to start new programs, that then there was gonna be a cliff and you could not continue with those programs and that staff. So that money is desperately needed in order to address the impact of COVID-19 on our schools. We have significant learning losses and they're far greater for students in our most underfunded low wealth school districts. So a lot of that funding really needs to be targeted at those learning losses. In addition, there are a lot of expenses regarding PPE and ventilation systems in schools and all of that. And it doesn't address the long-term problems caused by Pennsylvania system that would continue unabated. So what can the lawsuit accomplish? Studies show that these funding lawsuits do bring about revenue, that um, more revenue than the state would have otherwise raised. And obviously they have a significant impact on students and on their life trajectory and they increase academic achievement and lifetime success. And this lawsuit in our particular Commonwealth is obviously needed to break the political impasse over funding, which has been going on for decades and has impacted generations of students. And we need to have this independent process based on a cost analysis that looks at the needs of all of our children, recognizing that those who are in poverty, living in concentrations of poverty, need additional funding and that our state system needs to address that. So what can you do? We really uh, urge you to support fundourschoolspa.org. Go on the website, look at the resources there, add your story to that website, talk about what you see in your particular school district, share your story of what it looks like on the ground in the classroom. 
Um, stay informed about the lawsuit in, uh, by signing up at fundourschoolsva.org. There are opportunities for advocacy campaigns and calls to action, PA School Works, and we recommend that you really join this dialogue, know what's going on, learn about Level Up, which also has its own website at this point, which we'll put into the chat. And we really urge you to take action to volunteer to share your school funding story, but also think about writing a letter, an op-ed piece to your local newspaper. Think about your school board, perhaps adopting a resolution in support of the school funding case. Post on social media, email Pennsylvania legislatures, including the leadership, um, and uh, organize a presentation for your organization. And that is our contact information. And I think now we would have some time to answer a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go to questions, I just wanted to go um, just say thank you to both Maura and Dan for taking time out of your evenings. You have long, grueling days. And I, I wanted to go back to what Maura was saying about um, potentially passing a resolution. So it's really important that in every corner of the state, we are raising awareness about the school funding issues and that we're demanding action from every branch of our government. And so showing support for the lawsuit and, and helping people understand that there is a school funding lawsuit is going to be a big part of that. So the, the trial is tentatively set to go, it's tentatively, tentatively set to go to trial in the beginning of September. On September 9th, I think is the tentative date it could change. So between now and then, we as advocates have a lot of work to do in raising awareness that this is going to be happening. So that the day that this lawsuit goes to trial, people are talking about it all over the place and wondering what it's going to do to help make their schools better. Um, and that's not to say that lawmakers this legislative session can't take action right now to make things a lot better. They can increase state funding, they can increase um, equitable funding by doing the level up proposal or supporting Governor Wolf's budget. There's a lot they can do now that would take a big step toward helping. But we also as advocates need to be very, very um, vocal. So if you pass a resolution, if you know somebody who's on a school board or a township or a borough council, a board of supervisors, if you have a PTO that has a board, um, I'll put it in the chat. Ed Voters has a resolution that you can support in, in support of, that you can, you could pass in support of the school funding lawsuit. And then when you send that to your state lawmakers, then they see that you've passed it. A lot of times the press picks these up. So um, that's just one thing that you could do. And I will put the link to that in the chat. Um, and then I think there's a little time for questions that haven't been able to um, be answered yet. So I don't know if you want to raise your hand maybe, and then we can unmute you. And I think there's a couple of questions in the chat itself. Um, should we just run through those as? Um, sure, that'd be great. There was a, so there was a question about, um, about relative tax rates um, for districts that are, um, that um, are not at adequacy. Um, that would still be sort of hold harmless losers, quote unquote. Um, and Jonathan put the the taxes um, that their tax rates um, in the chat, and the, those districts are specifically above the state median. Um, it is a fact that um, one of the that that um, hold harmless um, par part of the hold harmless issue. Um, and again, ending hold harmless would not totally solve this problem. It absolutely wouldn't. But part of the hold harmless issue is that certain school districts have um, used the benefits of hold harmless to keep their taxes lower. That's just simply a fact. Um, and um, you know, my challenge to those districts, and I, you know, we talk to districts that are on that side, is that you know, that can't go on forever. Like that's, that, that, that's gonna collapse at some point. It is true that, that certain districts, particularly on the Western side of the state, um, where people are less inclined to raise taxes generally, um, are sort of using using um, hold harmless and so maybe they don't have school that, schools that quite enough quite good enough um, um, but they're good enough to keep their taxes low and so we've got to get past that and talk to people and say like that reality that's coming at the expense of other kids we've all we got to make sure everyone has enough um, there was also a question and Mara, if you want to take this it was about um, whether Philadelphia, is it whether it's too late for Philadelphia to be added? Um, isn't the school district of Philadelphia one of the districts that suffers the most from this current funding system? Do you want to take that? Yeah, and the answer to that, it is too late for that particular school district to join because we're about to go to trial and we're not amending the complaint, right, Dan? Um, but 
Uh, also, it is not necessary because, because Philadelphia, the school district, is currently represented in the case. NAACP is an organization, membership organization, that is a part of this case and that is asserting uh, the claims that are in this case. So a lot of school districts are represented here. We're looking for a statewide answer to this problem. So there are a lot of rural school districts as well who are represented in Pennsylvania Association of Rural and Small Schools. In addition, with respect to Philadelphia in particular, we do have parents from the school district of Philadelphia who are also petitioners in the case. So again, our our lawsuit is structured in such a way that it is to get a statewide answer to this problem, and it includes many, many school districts. Um, David Cohen asks, are there plans to ensure that what happened with the, the lawsuits over funding of the court system um, doesn't happen in this case? And for those that aren't familiar with that, um, in the 80s and 90s, um, counties sued the state of Pennsylvania for failing to um, pay um, what the counties believe were the state's responsibility for court costs. So the Court of Common Pleas now in Pennsylvania are largely funded locally at the county level. Um, and the courts at that time ruled that, um, that, they, that those counties were right, that the legislature was responsible. And after some, some improvements, the legislature essentially told the counties to go pound sand. So, okay, yeah, the courts say we're responsible, but try to make us add the money. Try to make us add the money. Um, now, that's a bit of an apocryphal story. Money did actually go into some improvements in the county system, um, but it is true that um, that there was there was an outcome that was largely seen eventually as not favorable. And my answer to that, what's different in this case, is like all of you, basically. Um, it is very possible um, for us to win this case and for it to be a victory on paper only. Now we're gonna do things to make sure that doesn't happen, right? But one of the things that we can do to make sure that this is not just a, a victory in, you know, in the law, but not in reality, is to have an engaged public forcing pressure in their legislature to say, now is the time to actually fix this. Because if we win, we're gonna get an order that's probably gonna give the legislature some time to actually fix the problem. Um, and again, if we were so lucky enough to win. Um, and at that point, it's gonna be so important for the legislature to really feel not only pressure from the court, but pressure from the public to fix it. So, you know, um, the, the, the answer really is, I mean, we've got some legal strategies, but we also, we know that the public needs to be engaged to make it a real victory. And if you look at other uh, school funding cases, you see that that's in fact what has occurred. You have Kansas, you have other places where there was pressure put by constituents who said, you gotta fix this, it's gotta yep. happen. So I think it's, it's those two in conjunction. I wanted to note that in the chat, there seem to be a few questions about cyber charters. And obviously to, to us, that is another example of the irrationality of this system, that you have a lot of cyber charter costs going out the window away from school districts. And they, they are actually, you know, they don't have the same costs and they don't have the same thing. And it's one of those absolutely clear um, inefficiencies that we are highlighting in the lawsuit. Uh, it is also something that the respondents have relied on a bit because they have actually chosen witnesses from cyber charter schools to say, well, all these kids have options. They can all go to a cyber charter school and get this great education, which of course the statistics tell you is not the case. Their educational outcomes are at the bottom of the of all of the uh, 500, you know, sort of school districts in LA and hundreds of LEAs. They don't do well. The, there's a high churn rate. There are a lot of issues with it. So it's actually one of the issues in the case that we'll be highlighting as being one of the irrationalities of this system and why we need a different system. And if anything, we certainly seen the last um, the last year how important it is to be in school, to be with your peers, to be with your teachers, um, at least on uh, for most students. And Pennsylvania is one of the uh, third highest cyber charter uh, school, you know, states in the nation. There are 12 uh, states that actually have laws prohibiting cyber charter because that's how some of the thinking goes in terms of how bad cyber charters are with regard to academic outcomes. 
Um, and we also, we have probably have time for a couple more questions. I mean, someone can, people can unmute themselves if they have them. In the meantime, I just want to plug um, getting involved with education voters. Um, Susan is one of the most important advocates that we have in the state. Um, someone with uh, experience on a school board, someone with experience in a community that doesn't necessarily always, you know, sort of in the middle of the road uh, and then in the middle of Pennsylvania, um, really has a pulse on what's going on. And I would just really uh, strongly encourage you to, to get involved. Um, so uh, the question is from Connie is, uh, local funding comes from real estate taxes, which also hurts low income areas. What other ways are there to fund um, districts? Mara, do you wanna do that one or do you want me to? Yeah, I think we can both probably talk about it. A Rhode Island is an example of a state that taxes a very, very different way in terms of their schools in order to ensure equity. They actually do it all through the state and they got rid of local property taxes. So that's an example. I don't know that that would happen here, but there are certainly a lot of different ways to do it. It is important to look at tax effort, which these formulas actually do um, in some ways. But uh, there, are, there are many different ways to fund it more equitably. And what we have here, obviously, is the state not stepping up to the plate and doing what it, it needs to do. And, and, you know, in terms of property taxes, I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of ways you can philosophically look at property taxes. The first, that it's one of our only ways to tax wealth. Um, but the problem, the, the, which is a good thing, I think, like in terms of progressivity of tax progressivity, but the downside is exactly what you said in the question, which is that sometimes you have people on fixed incomes who also have a house and they can't, you know, they're, they're really struggling. Um, you know, I think we're fairly agnostic as to the solution. I think though that there are plenty of ways, whatever the mix of taxes is, um, the first thing we have to do is we have to make it less dependent on local taxpayers because we're a heavily economically segregated state. And so the more we make it um, dependent on local taxpayers, um, the more of these in inequities we're gonna see. Because as we saw with the Reading versus New Hope chart, and that's like an extreme examples, right? But those, those disparities play out constantly where a place like Pottstown can tax and tax and tax, but there's really no way out for them. So whatever the mixture is that the state comes up with, um, um, there are ways to make it more progressive, even with the uniformity clause issues that we have. Um, but the bottom line is we have to make it less dependent on the local wealth and local income of a school district. Okay, if there are no more questions, um, yep, and as Tom says, as long as it's dependent on local taxes, there will always be disparity in funding, which is really true, it's really true. Um, so. I just, I see um, it's almost eight o'clock. And if you have any questions, you know, you can put them in the chat. I'll sit here for another minute, but I see our attorneys are done with the end of a really long day and I wanna respect their time. And I wanna respect the time of everybody who's on here who hung in here till the end. Um, you've really, this is a really super group. And I just say thank you to everybody who came tonight. Um, tomorrow, you'll get an email from me, we'll have a recording of the webinar and we'll have more resources and so that you can make sure to go to fundourschoolspa.org, which is a really neat website that has everything you ever wanted to know about the, the lawsuit on it. You can see how underfunded your own district is. You can sign up to share your story. You know what I mean? You can kind of become much more um, engaged with what's happening with the lawsuit. It's kind of neat. So I, I really encourage everybody to go there to visit that. So um, thank you everyone tonight for coming tonight. and. Um, We'll, we'll be in touch and I think we're going to win this fight and we're going to win this for kids because we have to and and, and it's, it's the moment is the moment is arriving so thank you very much thanks everybody thank you thanks a lot <laughs>